Now, I can understand that. I suppose most people could, but you've also had experiences uh, of future states. You've somehow yes. anticipated yes, I have. things. Yes. Uh, how, how do you explain that? Well, um, I believe it was Goethe who originally said it. Coming events cast their shadows before them. If you can imagine you're, 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 you're on the banks of, of a large uh, lake and the lake travels over the horizon and a stone falls, a large rock or landslide goes into the lake out of sight, the waves that come over it indicate to you some event. Well, if you can imagine that this is the present and that is the future, that is the sort of precognitive um, glimpse, flash of intuition, whatever you like to call it. Um, I knew my son would die and the boy with him if they flew together, whereas I hadn't the slightest objection to them going scuba diving together. Uh, and that all happened in one dreadful flash of intuition while we were falling about laughing mm -hmm. in the other room. And I warned him about it. And uh, You actually saw him dead? Uh, no, I saw an aeroplane, uh, a light aeroplane, I'm very familiar with aeroplanes, remember, rear up and disappear into a, a wooded horizon. Uh, no fire, which is odd with an aeroplane when it uh, crashes. And I picked up that he would be in it and the boy would be in it with him. I mean, they both... Both good friends, about the same age. I think Andy was probably a year or two older. Very good pilot. Uh, not all that experienced, but a good pilot, very safe pilot. <clears throat> it was just a, qu a question of the meeting of two world lines. If that happened, they would both be dead. And I told him that, whereas I never go around warning my family or children other than say, be careful in the car or something. And in that case, it proved most horribly true. Th these um, precognitions, are they absolutely deterministic? I mean, it, do you see something that is going to happen, or is there some way? Could your son have done anything other than yes. in fact he did? Yes. Oh, we're not talking about uh, predetermination. We're talking about a glimpse of a probability factor. Uh, having been given the glimpse of the probability factor, it's a warning. But you can then get on with it. How many experiences have you had of this sort in your life? Uh, these sort of moments of precognition of actually seeing what was coming. Virtually hundreds, I would have oh, thought, really? in a minor way, yeah. and in a major way, probably a dozen. I mean, mm. a dozen major ones that affected my life mm. totally. How many of them have been tragic? Not a great deal, because I deliberately wipe out that sort of level. You'll find a lot of people, when they're developing mediumship, <clears> come up against this the doom and gloom. I remember one lady came to see us, and I don't think any of us were going to survive longer than a week. The dog would probably last about a year, and all she saw was death and destruction in all directions. It's very easy to think negative. You tune into a certain plane of consciousness, mm -hmm. of the human collective unconscious, there's plenty of death and destruction going around, you'll pick it up. And then you see nothing but death and destruction. Now, what about your family? When, when did you get married? Uh, I was married the first time in 1942. 41 or 42, I can't even remember now. And that was to a very nice French girl who was in French intelligence, and I was with British intelligence, 43. So, as our commanding officers wouldn't even talk to each other, that didn't have much of a chance. And we had this wonderful daughter, who has since passed over when she was 41, the most adorable girl, whom I didn't see from the age of about three until she was about 17. And we just took off where we'd left off. Mm. And we had a marvellous relationship. She's a lovely girl. Love her very much, very much. And then I was married the second time in 19... for 40... Eight, I think it was. Mm -hmm. I'm not very good on To dates. a Scottish ballerina. <laughs> to a Scottish ballerina who had, I think, never seen Scotland. Uh, though her family very much came from Scotland. Mm -hmm. Her mother, though, was a Gadesden. She came from Dorset. Uh, Clementina's real name was Stuart McCall. Clementina Gadesden Stuart McCall. And my father-in-law was a marvellous man whom I adored. A uh, great tall Scot, a very beautiful voice, very modulated who I remember once we were walking through Piccadilly and right through the back streets of the Palladium and all the various ladies of easy virtue said, mm. Hello, Mike! Hello, Mike! Hello, Mike! Because <laughs> I used to play the, the nightclub, so you would know them because they used to bring the client in, you <laughs> yes. see, out of the rain. Mm. And they, they all knew my act and liked it. Mm. Hello, Mike! Hello, Mike! You see, all the barrow boys said, Hello, mate! All right, then! Doing all right at Palladium! And he said, You have a most interesting coterie of friends. <laughs> <laughs> He's a lovely man, I loved him. Michael, you've had an incredible amount of tragedy in your life. You've lost three children? Well, I, I, I've had five children. I have two surviving children. 
uh, physically surviving. Mm -hmm. I believe I have three others who are still surviving. At what ages were your children when they died? Uh, my son was 21. He was killed in an aeroplane. Uh, I then lost my eldest daughter, Elaine, whom I adore, and uh, she died of cancer. And uh, there was bitterness there because the most wonderful hospital, the Marsden, who looked after, I mean, they really were angels. They really were wonderful there. And uh, uh, they didn't have a CAT scanner. And I went to all the, polit uh, the political parties. I, I asked friends throughout the political spectrum during an election. And I remember one of them saying to me, my dear Michael, you can't expect sense from us during an election. Mm. But when else are you going to get it? Mm. You know, and I, I was very bitter about the fact that I had to go on the air and 21 different broadcasts in order to get the money in. Because the hospital asked me, and the last thing that my daughter Elaine said to me was, Daddy, please get them a CAT scanner. They need it. We got them the CAT scanner. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we raised 850,000 pounds in about four months. And what age was she? When she she was 41. Mm -hmm. She was my <coughs> eldest. Mm -hmm. And then uh, two or three years later, my next eldest, who was Fusty, who I also adored, a lovely girl, um, she was smitten with, with cancer. And she put up a terrific fight as well and sadly lost the fight. And, you know, I, I've never seen a whole ward weep before. I saw mm. it with Elaine. I saw the ward weep for, for Fusty mm. because they loved them both so much. And I'm immensely proud of them. And I carry that image. It's a great mm. comfort because mm. they're super girls. And if I want to tune in to see them in my own mind, I just think of either of them and they're there. It's a lovely mm. feeling. You weren't tempted to... Uh, a sort of why me bitterness type of scenario? No, I think it's a very n negative type of scenario, very negative type of attitude, and was against all my teaching as a child. No, um, the best thing I can recommend is anybody faced with this type of dreadful situation is to get rid of your grief as fast as you can. Get it out of you. Howl like a dog. Don't, don't bother about it. Go somewhere quietly and howl it mm. out of you. Get rid of the shock and then sleep, then come back and try and help all the other people who are who are grieving and, and uh, make cups of tea and help them positively and, mm. and try to adopt a positive attitude to survival. Whether you feel it's a self-delusion or not, it's a very good attitude to take. Mm. And, you know, don't shut your mind to your dead. Uh, think of them. I wonder how they're getting on. I wonder how they'll enter your mind again. It's a marvellous feeling. Not with, at, at first, it can be quite a difficult thing to do, but later you'll find it's a great comfort. You tune in quite a lot to all sorts of things. Have you had any, oh, what Wordsworth would call intimations of immortality, you know, his famous poem, he, he talks about children being brought in trailing clouds of glory to yes. the sense of the other world, which they gradually lose as life thickens around them and the shades of the prison house close around them, you know, it's an incredible thing. Yes. Um, do you occasionally have intimations of, of another reality that encompasses this one and gives meaning to it? I think I see it uh, many times uh, in a sunset, uh, in a sunrise, in a storm, uh, in the sea. I'm a very keen sailor and have been for years ever since I sailed in dinghies. And sometimes I've been praying on the cabin sole as a great gale came out of the west like a galloping stallion. At other times the sea has a sense of peace that literally passes all understanding. Mm -hmm. And I think I've seen heaven and hell on this earth uh, because you transcend the earth. It's a mental state. It's a state of consciousness. To me, heaven is a state of consciousness. But is, is there a presence for you in heaven other than the collective totality of all human consciousnesses? Yes, it's total love. It's a feeling of love. Love is the most encompassing, comforting. It's like being in the perfect womb, which is, I, I think, why the Virgin Mary is the symbol. It's, it's the, the womb of love. It's total comfort. It's but, but that's what the child goes back to. That's still a bit abstract and general, uh, love, um, womb. Do you have any um, convictions about the reality of a personal God, um, uh, the mystery that is behind creation being itself personal and able to relate to us? Yes, I have a very personal God, but God is love to me. Mm -hmm. That's what it's about. If you're into that wavelength, then you are communicating with God. That's why it's an all-pervading thing. And it can manifest in an animal or a baby or, or a, a child laughing or, or a beautiful woman or a beautiful old person. 
or a beautiful tree or a beautiful insect or a beautiful anything, a beautiful day, mm -hmm. beautiful flower. But, but have you the ever... The awareness of it is love. Yeah. Have you ever had a kind of um, moment where when time stood still? Oh, uh, yeah. oh yes, very much so. Well, when I died uh, the first time, I, uh, I definitely fainted. It, it was agonizing. I can't tell you how, how painful it was. And uh, the relief, for, an, for instance, I thought, my God, I'm dead. And I had darkness below me, like, but not frightening darkness. I was suspended in, in space time. And I had light around me. <clears throat> Wonderful feeling of light and a feeling of release and a feeling of love. There was no fear, just awe, awe, but not fear. And then I was pulled back out of it. I was waiting for somebody. The second time was after double pneumonia and erythromycin, which went wrong. And they lost, lost me again. They pulled me back. In this case, again, the light. And then being pulled back again, waiting for somebody. I know that when I go, I shall have somebody there. I know that. Michael, what do you think happens after death? I think just continuity. There may be a period of unconsciousness, um, the same as waking from a dream. You know, the, the, the Australian Aborigines refer to this as the dream life and the, uh, the, the time when we were asleep as the real life, because you're in a timeless situation there, yet it's absolutely real. I feel much the same. I think you continue the dream, if you like. And you move into a more advanced state. I mean, do, do you have a, however interpreted, some kind of concept of heaven? No, heaven is a state of mind for me. Mm -hmm. I don't think of it as an actual physical place, but then in a dream, everything is real. You can live in hell in a dream, a nightmare, or you can live in heaven in a dream where you meet in the dream all the people that you've known and loved who have passed on, if you like. That, to me, is what it's all about. Firstly, I, I think um, there are animals in it, because I always have animals in my dreams, because I'm very fond of animals, especially dogs. And uh, I think that one also, if one's had a, a, a degree of dislike, sometimes hate, but normally it's intense dislike or unease with somebody, you meet them in a dream and you've lost that. And that's a wonderful feeling. Because you feel, oh good, they, oh, that, that's marvelous, that's how it should be. Yeah, I think there's love in a dream. I think it's the most important thing. That's a heavenly dream to me, is a dream in which there's love. There are children, there's laughter, there's a lot of laughter, there's um, no suffering, no grief, and uh, the, once again, a glimpse or uh, a meeting with people that you've lost physically during your life. So, so there will be reunion Mm. with those that, uh, in Newman's great hymn, you've loved long since but lost a while. Yes, but that also applies to my dogs too. I should probably knock yeah. flat instantly. Yeah. <laughs> Apart from um, your own immediate family, yeah. uh, whom would you like to meet um, when you kind of step over onto the other side, especially that you haven't known on Earth? Oh, golly Moses, that's a different one. Says, I'd love to meet Leonardo da Vinci. I, I, I'd love him to teach me mirror writing. <laughs> mirror writing? He was very good at that. He wrote everything in mirror writing. Uh, so you Reverse. have to hold it up to a mirror. Yes, yes. he was very clever. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I have, uh, I'd love to meet Albert Einstein, uh, as opposed to when a child. You know. uh, I think that would be a wonderful experience, too. To, because Einstein was this wonderful figure that my father told me about. I'd love to meet uh, Nikola Tesla who was the same sort of genius in electrical engineering that Einstein was in physics. Um, oh, there are many people I'd love to meet. 